All right, this is our discussion of Hamlet, Act 5, and this is for the students at MCA in their 11th and 12th grade Bible class. Throughout the semester, we were reading Hamlet in conjunction with the Book of Esther. We were making a comparison and a contrast between the two books. Um, so we're just going to go over the last act, Act 5, for those of you who are still tracking us with Hamlet, and some of the information will be helpful for you in the final exam that we're taking with the class. First thing we have at the top of Act 5 is Hamlet and Horatio come across a grave digger. And the grave digger is in the process of digging a grave, and uh, Horatio and Hamlet and the grave digger get into a bit of a conversation. And there, Hamlet says uh, these following lines. I'm going to read them. These are from the play. It's Act 5, Scene 1, lines 214 to 223. Hamlet says, Alexander died, referencing Alexander the Great. He says, Alexander died. Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth to dust. The dust is earth. Of earth we make loam. And why of that loam whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? Imperious Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that the earth which kept the world in awe should patch a wall to expel the winter's flaw. One of the things we see throughout the book of Hamlet, and especially here in the last act, is Hamlet's contemplations of death. What does it mean not only to die, but because we die, what does it mean to live? And one of the things that Hamlet brings us face to face with is that regardless of who we are, we are going to we are going to die. And Hamlet here mentions Alexander, meaning Alexander the Great, and then of course Imperius Caesar, right? Whether this is Caesar Augustus or Julius Caesar, all the various Caesars throughout the history of the Roman Empire, highly likely Julius Caesar since Shakespeare will write a uh, you know, famous play called Julius Caesar. And Hamlet, again, is mentioning it doesn't matter who we are, we pass away, we return to the earth, and then parts of that earth will be used to make loam, will be used to uh, make the stoppers for beer, for beer kegs, will be used to make stoppers for holes in walls uh, to keep the wind out. It's just, again, a very important thing that we all have to come to terms with. And again, uh, life and death is certainly at, in the forefront in the story of Esther. And Esther has that great line uh, that she quotes, or that she says when she agrees to go into Xerxes' presence, uh, if I perish, I perish. So while Hamlet and Horatio are engaging with this grave digger and contemplating death, they notice that a funeral procession is on the way. And they discover that the funeral procession is for Ophelia. And Hamlet and Horatio hide out and they observe the funeral procession. They see Laertes and Laertes jumps down into the grave where his sister's body is or is going to be buried. And Laertes is making some massive claims about how much he loved his sister, how it's a shame that she's died so young, and he holds Hamlet accountable. And Hamlet jumps into the scene and contends that he loved Ophelia. And this claim uh, lands him in a scrape with Laertes. They start to have a, a bit of back and forth. And this is something that Hamlet says. And again, I'll make a statement about Hamlet's character in just a minute. This is a, uh, in that same act, scene one, this is lines 267 to 277. This is Hamlet will speak. Then Laertes will offer a line, then Hamlet will speak again. Hamlet comes into the scene, interrupts Laertes' mourning the death of Ophelia, and says, What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis, whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wander-wounded hearers? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. And Laertes responds, The devil take thy soul. To which Hamlet replies, Thou prayest not well. I pray thee, take thy fingers from my throat. So Laertes, when he sees Hamlet, has jumped out and has attacked Hamlet and is strangling him. Hamlet says, take thy fingers from my throat, for though I am not splinteous and rash, splinteous meaning quick-tempered, yet have I in me something dangerous, which let thy wisdom fear. So I'll make two statements about Hamlet here is, Hamlet sees someone in their grief, 
making statements about how much, uh, in this case, Laertes, how much he mourns the loss of his sister and also blames Hamlet. And Hamlet jumps into the scene partly to defend himself and also to set himself up as no one feels loss as deeply as I feel loss. It's one of the claims Hamlet makes at the beginning of the play. No one seems to be mourning the loss of my father the way that they should, especially not my mother Gertrude. And he says he will make the statement to his mother, I have within me more than just the external trappings of woe. And here Hamlet will rise up and say, no, Laertes, I am just as sad for the loss of Ophelia, if not more sad than you. And then when Laertes attacks Hamlet, Hamlet will basically tell him, I have it within me, a danger, a mortal danger, enough to hurt you, and you would be wise to heed to that and to not push me too far. And again, this is something we see about Hamlet throughout the course of this play. We are watching his actions, but we also get to hear him say a lot about himself. So when every character or whoever, whenever someone in reality says something, the question then becomes, is that true? And then do their actions support that statement? And Hamlet one of the things we see when we compare him and contrast him against Esther, there is not much that is recorded of Esther saying. If we were to compare the amount of words that Esther is credited with saying in the book of Esther to what Hamlet says in the, book, in the play of Hamlet, Hamlet will win the day with the amount of words. And Hamlet certainly does things throughout the course of this play. and We will see them here in the last act, especially some of his most dramatic actions. But we see that Esther... Certainly, without talking much about who she is, she lets her actions speak for that. And Hamlet is a little bit of both. He will talk a lot about who he is, and then his actions oftentimes will contradict that. But he will act as if he's someone who's got it all together, and he's a philosophical individual. And there's much that can be admired about that. We will see when it comes time to do something, though, there's a hesitation or a variety of reasons that he will give. All right. So after he has this um, interaction with Laertes, he agrees to a duel with Laertes. Laertes says, I, I hold you accountable for my sister's death. And because of that, we are going to have a sword fight. It will be more of a friendly sword fight. But if I win, then I'll, I'll have at least that to go away with. Then in the next scene, scene two of act five, Hamlet confesses, um, to what he calls an unsettled heart, and he admits a divine will that supersedes man's will. This is a, a crucial passage in the entire play. It's Act 5, Scene 2, lines 4 and 5, and then lines 11 and 12. This is Hamlet talking to Horatio, and he says, In my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. So on the one hand, he admits to Horatio, I've had this thing within me, this issue. And at the beginning of the play, we know it's the loss of his father. In addition to the loss of his father, there's this recognition from Hamlet of no one else is mourning the loss of my father like I think they should. Then he has, as he is working to avenge his father throughout the play, I come now to the final act. He makes a very profound statement to Horatio that there is a divinity that shapes and forms all of this regardless of what we do. Now, that is not to dismiss human free will and human action, but it is to let know that you have human free will and action, and yet there is this divinity that supersedes all of that. And we see this certainly in the story of Esther, where Mordecai will tell Esther, if you think you can hide out, and not rescue the Jews. The Jews will be saved with or without you. And if you don't help them, you and your house will be destroyed. But who knows that you weren't put here for such a time as this. To which Esther responds eventually, I will do this. And I will go in to try to rescue my people. And if I perish, if that's Jehovah's will, that's Jehovah's will. And if I live, 
and that too is Jehovah's will. And we see this too to bring in our character study of Jonathan. It's what Jonathan tells his armor bearer before they attack the Philistine garrison. We may win. Jehovah may bless us and give, give us the victory. Jehovah can win with a few men or with many men. But if he doesn't give us the victory, that's also Jehovah's will. Some profound things to be thinking about. So after Hamlet makes his confession to Horatio, he informs Horatio of how he turned on Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And then move in, Hamlet will fight Laertes, and the royal court goes red with the death of many lives. So in scene two of Act Five, Hamlet and Laertes are fighting, they're sword fighting. And what we know before the sword fight is that Claudius has had Laertes poison the tip of his sword so that even if he nicks Hamlet, Hamlet will suffer. And if he gets a good enough strike, Hamlet will eventually die. In addition to that, Claudius says, as you guys are sword fighting, you guys often want to break and get a drink. I will make sure that I poison the drink that Hamlet is supposed to uh, take a sip from so that then we're doubly ensured that he will, he will die. So we come into the sword fight. Hamlet cuts Laertes as they're fighting. This mortally wounds Laertes, and Laertes makes a, one of his last few remarks. He says, line 337, I am justly killed with mine own treachery. I mean, the comparison to Haman in the story of Esther, it's undeniable, right? The very thing that Haman would have built to kill the Jews is the object, the gallows, that would be used to put him to death and his ten sons to death. And the very thing, the law of the king, that he would use to uh, make legal, although highly unethical, but make legal the death of the Jews, a law would be written allowing the Jews to protect themselves. While Hamlet is fighting, he, when he strikes Laertes, Gertrude is very excited. She wants her son to win, and she drinks, uh, makes a toast, if you will, to, to Hamlet. And she unknowingly drinks the cup that was intended for Hamlet. And she, uh, she starts to swoon, and Claudius reacts in a way to try to tell Gertrude that's not what she was supposed to do. <clears throat> and then rapid secession. Laertes, just before he dies, he will tell Hamlet. It was all Claudius's plot, and it's uh, Claudius's fault now that Gertrude is dying. So then Hamlet turns and stabs Claudius. Claudius dies. Then Laertes dies, and uh, Hamlet assigns, and just before Hamlet uh, dies, he assigns a last task or request to Horatio. So go boat back over that again. Gertrude drinks from the cup intended for Hamlet. She dies. Hamlet stabs King Claudius. Claudius dies. Laertes, having already been struck by Hamlet, Laertes dies because of the poisoned swords. And then Hamlet, because he's been struck several times, will also collapse. And just before he dies, he tells Horatio this. This is Act 5, Scene 2, lines 379 to 384. Things standing thus unknown shall I leave behind me. If thou didst ever hold my heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. So Hamlet's request to Horatio is, don't mourn my death yet. Be sure that you tell my story because I understand that rumors are going to run amok here, right? We've just had this slaughtering in the palace. There have been rumors about my sanity for a long time. There's obviously been speculation over how King Hamlet died and you need to get the news out. And Horatio agrees to this. And just after Hamlet dies, Fortinbras, from earlier in the play, uh, young Fortinbras, shows up with his army. And we find out uh, earlier in the play that Hamlet had sent word to Fortinbras. And Fortinbras has shown up as a result of Hamlet's request. So Fortinbras appears with his army. He orders a proper burial for Hamlet. And Horatio guarantees that he can tell the story of Hamlet. And this is Act 5, Scene 2, lines 421 to 428. Horatio gives a high speech uh, saying that Hamlet was this good man and also saying Hamlet, though he turned on Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, did not order their deaths. Because one of the things Fortinbras, we will find out when Fortinbras appears with his crew, is that uh, Fortinbras' group had Rosencrantz and Guildenstern killed. 
as a request from Hamlet. Uh, Fortinbras will praise Hamlet. He will criticize the scene of carnage that lies in the castle. And there's these last few lines here. Uh, this lines 445 to 446. This is Fortinbras speaking. He says, soldiers, uh, he orders the soldiers to play music and the right of war speak loudly for him. So talking about Hamlet. And then he also says of the scene here in the castle with Gertrude's body, um, Laertes' body, Claudius's body, and now Hamlet's body. Uh, Fortinbras says this scene becomes the field, uh, but shows much amiss within the palace. So there's a, this is not how a palace is supposed to look. And that's something that we can see throughout the story of Hamlet, that it's showing us corruption and things amiss within the court, the place where you're supposed to have reason and moral character and rightly controlled emotions because it's from the, the palace, the castle, that law gets passed down. And if, if there's corruption with uh, under the crown or for those who wear the crown, then that corruption is going to be transferred down through the people. So last few things we'll say here when we contrast and compare Hamlet with Esther is one that they're both young characters, younger, right? Uh, they're both royal characters. Uh, they both have a call to action. Uh, Esther is called to deliver the Jews from the Holocaust, and Hamlet is called to avenge his father's death. Uh, Hamlet is nearly alone throughout the course of the play. Even though he has Horatio that he leans on, there's really no one else that he's going to. He leaves himself to himself a lot. Now, again, there is a benefit to being alone and taking time with our thoughts, and of course, praying, fasting if necessary, but also being being away from people is important. But an, an excessive amount of that at times can have adverse effects on a human being. We were made uh, to be social and to be with others, why it's important to have good counsel. And of course, the highest counsel being the scripture, the word of God and God and God himself in prayer. Um, Esther is alone, certainly when she approaches Xerxes, and when she requests that he come to the banquet, but she also stays in contact with Mordecai and has a group of people that she can trust to carry messages back and forth between her and Mordecai. And then at the end of that story, we see that Esther and Mordecai are essentially working together. Another major thing to keep in mind when reading Esther, certainly, and Hamlet alone, but bringing them together, it just reinforces everything. There is a divine will over the course of of existence over the universe and over the human being. This does not discount human free will and human responsibility. It just lets us know that the divine will, the will of God, the will of Jehovah, supersedes that of man. Um, Hamlet spends a lot of time promoting himself, and Esther ends up promoting Mordecai. She does what needs to be done, but when you look back at the book of Esther, it's Mordecai. Esther certainly gets recognized, and the book the, the book is named after her, but it's fascinating how it ends with the elevation of Mordecai. Something we're thinking about there. And then, of course, when we compare Esther and Hamlet together, the key question we've been asking this entire semester as we've studied the books is, whom do you trust? Whom do you trust? And then a good question to follow that up with is, are you a trustworthy person? And I hope so. And I appreciate you listening to this lecture. Some of what we've covered today, especially the scene of who died and when, uh, will be involved in the final exam. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts when we meet together later. Thank you.